Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Come, go, do. Those are the action words in today's gospel text. So, is today's gospel text about a miraculous healing or is it about a miraculous faith? Yes. Crickets. <laughs> yes is the correct answer. I heard it in there. Yes. It is about both. So let's get to that. After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of his people, he entered Capernaum. What are these things that he just finished saying that the text speaks of? Well, we have to go to chapter 6 for that. And after naming his apostles, Jesus is ministering to these crowds by giving them the Beatitudes. He goes through a list of woes to, who reject God's truth. Then he gives direction to love and care and pray for your enemies, guidance on not being judgmental, and bearing fruit in keeping with faith. And build the house of your faith on the solid rock of his words. So those are the things that they had just been exposed to. Those are the things that he had been talking about before he came in to Capernaum. Kafur Nahum, the sixth to the last book of the Old Testament, Nahum. This is the town of Nahum. That's what Kafur Nahum means. This small fishing village on the north shore of Galilee still exists today. You can visit it. And with the wonders of the internet, you can do so without getting in a plane. There are some really interesting things that you don't have to travel there to see. It's <clears throat> a couple of uh, monasteries are there. And atop the ruins of a house is a chapel with a glass floor that looks down on that house. Possibly the house of Peter, but definitely the ruins of a house in the town where Peter lived. And this was not a very large fishing village. Definitely the ruins of a house. Now, we are talking about a village, not a town or a city. You know, places where everyone knows everyone. Everyone knows each other's business. Maybe tens, maybe hundreds, but definitely not thousands of people. There must have been at least 10 Jewish men in this town because it had a synagogue. A synagogue that was built by the centurion in today's text, which, the ruins of which, still stand today. I sometimes think it's important for us to remember that these are not stories from a long, long time ago, from a land far, far away, although those two things do apply. These are real stories about real events that took place in the life of our real Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Caring for, teaching people in a place that still exists today. Now, a centurion had a servant who was sick to the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent the elders of the Jews asking him to come and heal his servant. Now, John gives us a little more details than does Matthew on this narrative. And one can see sending a delegation on your behalf as the same as being there yourself, but it's a different conversation. The important parts of the narrative are in both narratives. The substance of the events of the narrative are there. <coughs> Teach, teaching us some profound things through miraculous events, the miraculous love. Love of a centurion for his servant and love of Jesus for all. The man is a Roman centurion, a leader by his name of a hundred soldiers. <coughs> and the elders and the Jews of this town. He's Rome's representative in this little village as well. The leaders of the synagogue in this town of Capernaum, they're doing bidding on his behalf. And by the exchange, it seems that they are very pleased with, happy with, they like this guy. They're coming to make <coughs> pleas on his behalf. A 
highly valued servant. And the way it reads, one could almost say, and what we know from the history of these times, that people often saw family members, their servants as family members. They loved them that much. We have a bunch of fourth commandment stuff going on here. But what a beautiful picture of the harmonious nature of the proper application of the fourth commandment. A Roman soldier who loves his servants so much that he makes a bold request on his behalf. Jewish leaders who love their appointed leader so much that they make bold requests on his behalf. What a joy it is when brothers dwell together in harmony. Parents with children, siblings with each other, in-laws, neighbors, co-workers, classmates, pastors, teachers, leaders, employers. When we do what we're told, because what a joy it is to serve those who we know have our best interest in heart, our master, our leader. When that kind of relationship exists, it is a beautiful one. Well, maybe the world you live in is not so harmonious as Capernaum. Maybe you chafe under authority. Maybe you don't like those who lead you. Lead you. Maybe you don't like those who you lead. Well, <clears throat> let me remind you that Jesus said what he said to the people before he came into Capernaum. Love and care for your enemies. Don't be judgmental. Bear fruit in keeping with your faith and build your house on the solid rock of his word. Let's go back to Capernaum and listen to the Jewish leaders as they speak on behalf of this centurion, their leader. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly. They didn't say, hey, this guy's got a request. They pleaded with him earnestly. He is worthy to have you do this for him. He loves our nation. And he is the one who built our synagogue. His actions reflect his words. What makes him worthy? To have Jesus do this for him? We have a Roman centurion who loves his servant and the Jewish nation, the text tells us. And we have Jewish elders who by their actions seem to love their appointed leader. This Roman centurion, because of his kindness and generosity, this makes him worth their affection, but does it make him worth a miraculous event on his behalf? Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. That's why he didn't go, because he didn't want to, in some way, make him unclean. I didn't presume to come to you. This Roman centurion must have become more than just the leader, but a member of this community. He loves his servants like family. He understands Jewish customs, being a goyim, an outsider, a Gentile, even though he very possibly, many theorized, had converted to the Jewish faith. He will always be an outsider, even if he is coming to the Jewish faith. Unworthy, unclean. And it's okay with him. He knows his place. He knows his place in accord with God's will. We are back to that beautiful picture of the fourth commandment playing out as God would have it. <clears throat> How it's supposed to work. When loving, respectful, subordinate people come to each other, loving and giving a servant leader, Christ himself, and the strength of his faith, which is displayed through the understanding. Understanding of God, a God who has got an order, Benevolent, that you can trust. And that is a beautiful thing that guides his relationship and those relationships in this narrative. 
It's easy to submit, it, it, it's easy to submit to someone who you trust, who you believe has your best interest at heart. Competent person who you think is a good leader. It takes a while in life for us to get past the old Adam within us to have these kinds of relationships. But these kinds of relationships in this life are possible. Roger and Myrna Dance sitting in the back there today. This coming Thursday, we'll celebrate their 64th wedding anniversary. Before you clap, only a few pews in front of them is a couple, Herb and Laverne Sharp, who too, about two weeks later, in the same month, on the same year, 1952, got married 64 years ago. Let's give them a hand. But I would venture to guess that over that time frame, there were one or two disagreements. Something that Geta and I call intense fellowship. <laughs> Unfortunately, lifelong, loving, trusting relationships are in our day and age more the exception than the rule. When spouses, friends, family members, and neighbors sin against each other, broken relationships are cast aside like yesterday's garbage. But there is one thing that all broken relationships have in common. That old Adam I was talking about earlier, he goes along with you into each of those relationships seeking to break them up. We are created in his image. And we can't run from ourselves, but being created in his image when we break from his simple truths, it causes pain and suffering. Refusing to work with others and reconciling broken relationships. Gender bending, family redefining, life disregarding. These are things that chip away at the faith of any individual and any community. Making it weak, untrusting of everyone else and the God who promises to do the reconciling and redeeming. Our society's mad at God, a God that they say doesn't exist. And they're mad at you when you speak the truth and love about that God. But faith that sees who God is and what he does for us stands in awe of such a loving God and says, I am unworthy and unable, Lord, but only say the words, and your will be done. Notice the centurion is even acknowledging that God must do the speaking for this miraculous thing to take place. But say the word, and let my servant be healed, for I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. To my servant, do this, and he does it. Go, come, do. Notice the centurion doesn't ask kindly, come, go, do. He directs. Notice the centurion, too, is under authority. His tribune tells him to come, go, or do. And he does it. He would come, go, or do wherever or whatever he was told by his tribune. Now, how appropriate it is that on this day, when we, in the middle of a weekend where we celebrate the sacrifice of those who gave the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom, that a loving centurion would be the focus of God's truth. We remember those, and we are thankful for their sacrifice. Military communication, organization, and order is about efficiency and success, and success. Feelings are not part of the equation. In a the military, there's no time for a question and answer period. Lawful orders must be followed immediately, without question. Delays could cost people their lives. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should run our society like the military, although those of us with a military background might think that's a good idea. What the centurion is speaking of 
is not about blind obedience. Every military person knows that orders must be followed when they are lawful. This is obedience that acknowledges the authority and the knowledge of the one who gives the direction. Even if I don't know why I'm doing it, I know that's in my best interest to do it. I know that it's lawful. I know that it's coming from a trustworthy source. The centurion's actions and words display a true faith in Christ that acknowledges his authority, acknowledges who he is. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. To marvel the creator of the universe is no small task. Turning to the crowd, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such a faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. The proof is in the pudding. A miraculous healing, a miraculous faith. Go, live a life that reflects the love and trust that, and relationship that you have with your creator so that others can have that as well. In Jesus' name, amen.